And the man walked around the world and said to the king, Sir, I come from France. Sir, come for France. You see? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I know this video idea is a little bit unorthodox, but just know that this video might allow me to go to Florida and finally try Whataburger and poor Talos. And hopefully, one day, I can go to Texas and try Lubies. Hi, I'm Kitty Bunk, and I'm here to talk to you about King of the Hill. Or more specifically, Peggy Hill. You gotta say it exactly like that, like Peggy Hill, not Peggy Hill. Sorry. Actually, Kitty, I think you might have discussed Peggy like a year ago almost. What? My opinions can change. Now, Peggy is a character that for a while had a horrible reputation amongst the video essay community. However, in recent years, we've reevaluated her and realized, hey, maybe we were too tough on her. I mean, she's also Mary Sanderson, guys. Did not make the connection until a few Halloweens ago. Mary does sound like Peggy with no accent. It's not to say Peggy is immaculate. I still think the problem with her is either the episode would not give her enough consequences or they would take her side. Or she could be too realistic, as we all know a Peggy in our own lives. Or even if she was in character, her shtick was not good. Despite all this, I wanted to bring up at least 10 nice things Peggy did throughout the show. So, not wanting to waste any more time, let's discuss. Starting with, of course, the honorable mentions. Alright, my first entry is the episode By Stan Me. One of my all-time favorites. Peggy gets a job writing for the newspaper. Again. Only compared to before, her new job is giving household hints. Who to vote for, great books to read, how to think. Oh no, nothing like that. I'm talking about household hints. You know, getting rid of mildew, treating stains. Of course, we know that much like me, Peggy can't cook or clean worth a damn. Even Bobby was better at it than her. So she forms a partnership with Min, where in exchange for the crossword puzzle answers, Min will call up her mother-in-law and get Peggy some hints. Eventually, Min closes the pipeline, and as Peggy can't just call Lauma herself or get the bulldozer to do it, Peggy tries a hint of her own. To harness the cleaning power of ammonia, with the whitening power of bleach. Peggy, that's the recipe for mustard gas. Yeah, no it's not. I'm guessing maybe they were afraid people would try this, or Hank's source for this is Cotton, who wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed when it came to chemistry. Are you sure I'm making mustard gas? Yes, my dad used to mix up a big batch of it to celebrate VJ Day. Wait, where was I? Anyhow, disclaimer, don't try this, it's still deadly, and do not sue me. Don't mix together cleaning products, you don't know what's in them, that's all I'm gonna say. Peggy goes through the effort of stealing every paper she can, really every single one, with a little help from Hank, Dale, Bobby, and the ex-newspaper delivery guys. However, the reason it's an honorable mention is thanks to the ending. In any other episode, Peggy would clean up her mess and then go home without anything happening to her. Here, she tries to bring consequences upon herself for, for almost poisoning the town. I owe my readers one last column. I almost killed them, and now I have to break their hearts. She submits an apology letter and tries to resign from the paper. In conclusion, I was so busy trying to figure out how to remove the stains that I forgot about the people who actually create them. Her boss refuses, instead deciding to keep Peggy on, but just keeping a closer watch over her. I don't need you for facts, Peggy. We got a fact checker for that. Actually, I guess I gotta let her go in light of this mustard gas thing. You should also fire her for thinking that mustard gas is the same thing as <laughs> gas. My second is her actions in beer and loathing. She learns that Alamo beer got pulled from the shelves, i.e. everybody's favorite beer, so she gets a temp job in order to get to the bottom of what's going on. In truth, some of the beer was tainted with cleaning solution, ew. So they moved all of the beer to Mexico. To force a public announcement, she ends up serving the Alamo higher-ups the tainted beer in order to show them what their actions are doing to people. This 
allows them to finally tell the public what's going on. Enough to get your business back. It won't happen again. Because we're not just a company. We're a family. And we're sorry. The reason it's an honorable mention is because while Peggy does something noble, Hank and the episode both shame her for literally just doing her job. As Peggy is part of Alamo, she has to sign an NDA, meaning that by law, she cannot tell anybody about what's happening behind closed doors, even if she really wants to. I'll get out the foot lotion. Oh, stop begging. What about no secrets, huh? Till death do us part? Think about that, Peggy. Death. Granted, she tries to find a loophole by telling Hank he has to be patient, which he and his friends don't do. They instead drive down to Mexico and buy Alamo there, despite outright being told not to do it. You care more about your stupid confidentiality agreement than your own husband. And you care more about your friends and your beer than you do about my stupid confidentiality agreement. Imagine if the roles were reversed and Peggy broke his trust. How awful that would be. Eh, you know what? Eh, screw it. I guess this could be number 11. You know what? Now it's number 11. This is now a top 11 list. Where does Peggy get off being so mad at me? Yes, I broke her confidence and lied about it, but she, well, she, uh. This is why I don't drink beer. Only bourbon and only wine and only screwdrivers and only mimosas. The end. What an interesting jacket. Well, actually, it was given to me by the Arlen Boggle Boosters. They got local businesses to sponsor my trip. Why, you're at the very beginning of a rags-to-riches story. <laughs> <sighs> like most other things in my life, I learned about it from King of the Hill. Chicken fried this, mac and cheese being a veggie that, because it has no meat, apparently. And Boggle. It's such a great game to play to ground yourself. My, my grandmother, she lives in a motorized wheelchair, and sometimes when I get really carried away, she makes me sit down and play Boggle with her until my medicine kicks in. Whoever got that reference, you deserve a veteran discount. As it turns out, one of Peggy's passions in life is Boggle, which is basically a game much like Scrabble, but you have to find the words rather than make them. Well, I mean, I guess in a way you make them, but they're provided for you. It, I don't know, it's weird. Peggy enjoys playing the game with Luann and the other housewives, and she's so good that she gets an offer to play at the Elks Lodge. Oh, little sick boy. Would you like for me to find your name in the next boggle? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I hope that your leg gets better real soon, Zachary Quinn Jr. And she wins that one so easily that she is also offered the chance to compete at the state boggle level, with the Arlen Boggle Booster sponsoring her. I promise to make Derek King, Mr. Lube, and Rivera Sump Pumps proud. This weekend, Peggy Hill is gonna put Arlen, Texas on the map. To be fair, I guess this one isn't as selfless as a lot of her other actions, hence it being so low. But maybe because this was season one, Peggy wasn't as egotistical here as she could be later on. Mom's trophy's bigger than yours. Oh, Pooh, I don't care about the trophy. The real honor is getting to represent Arlen in the State Boggle Championship. Think about it. If this aired in, like, season six, she would be treating that trophy like her child and ignoring Bobby in order to provide for it or something like that. Here, it's just a fun game to her. Winner, Peggy Hill. Oh, I don't believe it. You played a great game. I'm sure if it weren't for Sissy Cobb, if she ended up losing, she would have taken it in stride. Plus, even when she wins, she's pretty humble about it. At worst, you could say she's just competitive, which apparently you have to be in a cutthroat game like Boggle. Okay, that's time. Pencils down. Let's tote them up. Oh, I hope you don't mind, but I only used words that appear in Patsy Klein lyrics. <laughs> Once again, compare it to, say, her actions at trying to win a beauty contest or a taxidermy competition. This time, her victory is well earned. And the word that wins her that victory... Ain't. <laughs> ain't is not a word. It ain't, ain't, Sissy Cobb. 
the word is acquaintanceship, as in it was not my pleasure to make your acquaintanceship. Keep in mind that most standard boggle sets have 16 letters, and that word has 16 letters. You go, girl. This menu is totally whack. Personally, I like the La Crepe Suzette. Get out! You talk French? Oh, Poquito. Oh yeah, I get to talk about Oh yeah. Strickland Propane gets a new sales associate named Tammy Duval from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Story short, she's dumb as a charcoal briquette. Ugh, redundant name. Eh, then again, Jersey City, New York, New York. I guess I can't totally complain. Tammy is a charismatic young woman who was given a rough hand at life, much like Luann. So Luann, you go to community college? That is awesome. I am totally impressed. I've never even finished a whole book. But unlike Luann, she's effectively homeless in a former... Okay, I can't say the word that y'all want me to say, so I will call her a body worker. She ran away from her abusive pimp. Tammy wants to go straight, but doesn't know how. Well, here's Peggy to help out. She lets her sleep on the couch. Hey, that rhymes. She tries to help Tammy get her GED, inspiring her to study. Here is the first book you're going to finish. Congo by Michael Crichton. This is the kind of book people read on planes. And in return, Tammy gives her a great makeover. I am Peggy Hill, Mike's teacher. You're a teacher? Why are you dressed like that? What? <laughs> is there a dress code for teachers now? Piggy's like me, attractive but doesn't wear anything that flatters her. Even after Hank discovers Tammy's origins and the hills feel betrayed, Tammy reveals the impact Peggy had on her. But I'm almost finished with Congo. I'm up to the part where they shoot the super monkeys with the ray gun. You actually are reading it. I don't know any of this. All I know is I think he wrote Jurassic Park, right? As Tammy is voiced by Renee Zellweger, we don't see what happens to her, beyond a quick cameo at Luann's wedding. However, I like to think that thanks to Peggy, Tammy is now living her best life. She got a GED, maybe even a family, and it's all thanks to Peggy. Nobody thinks you're a pimp. But if you were, you'd be the coolest, nicest, most awesome pimp there ever was. Don't be silly. We can't die if we're on TV. They'd never air it. <laughs> I think it goes without saying that Peggy and Nancy have a weird relationship throughout the show, but they also have a great, enduring friendship. They can always count on one another and support each other, like when Peggy stayed with Nancy all night when Tail was out with Sheila, or when Nancy showed her how to reinvigorate the spark in her marriage with Hank during those dreams. And she didn't really care Hank was having dreams about her. Perhaps my favorite moment is this episode. The audience for the news station is starting to dislike how many broadcasts Nancy is getting wrong, even if, as she puts it, her job isn't to check the weather, just read off a teleprompter. My job is to pronounce it, not predict it. Oh, don't feel so bad. You know what they say about the weather in Texas. If you don't like it, just wait five minutes. So she gets demoted to a glorified secretary while a meteorologist takes over, which I feel kinda makes sense. It's cheaper in a way, and Nancy is such an awful person, I don't think she has that much of a report with her fellow employees. Plus, her job sucks anyway. Remember the age discrimination lawsuit? Throughout the episode, Nancy's confidence wavers, but Peggy never stops trying to encourage her. She gives Nancy a major pep talk. You may look like a southern belle, but deep inside you are pure Rottweiler. Think of how many lives you ruined. Heck, I've seen you break up entire baby showers with one catty remark. I wish we saw this. Then she and Dale suggest that Nancy could do a daring raiding stunt by going to an active wildfire and recording what's happening. That way, she can get her job back. <laughs> well, that's probably Mother Nature's way of giving us the wrap-it-up sign. This has been Nancy Hicks-Gribble. No, no, not has been, still is. 
keep going. They do almost end up dying and humiliated. In a related story, so did our own Nancy Hicks Gribble. But it earns Nancy a promotion. Now she's a news anchor and a field reporter, not another weather girl. Granted. Oh God, <laughs> baby, I always hoped we'd die together. Peggy, you go die over there. Eh, at least Peggy took it like a champ. Fine, why don't we all go? Perhaps we'll all get a refresher on what's important to a child and what's just a desperate attempt to prove to the world that you're a good mother. Okay, this section is a little tricky, but bear with me. In the later seasons, Luann starts to date Lucky, a noted redneck with a heart of gold and teeth like fresh corn, until she breaks her born-again virgin rules and lets his tractor plow over her grass, right? Isn't that what tractors do? While I do have problems with how Peggy made Lucky fail his GED exam, or the fact that Luann never finds out that Peggy basically betrayed her trust for life, Oh, kitty? White Platter is on the phone. I'll tell him I will get to him after I finish this video, Catherine. God, I have work. Thankfully, I do think Peggy made up for it, somewhat. Thank you for helping us register for our baby shower, Aunt Peggy. Well, when I heard you planned to get all your baby supplies at 7-Eleven, I decided it was time to step in. In the final season, Luann is due to give birth any day now, and Peggy is on hand to assist her and Lucky, be it telling her niece all of the joys about giving birth, but leaving out the stress, the non-consensual husband stitch, granny panties, and possible bed pooping that goes along with it. <sighs> I did not fully wake up until the ride home from the hospital. That's what I want, Aunt Peggy. A foggy memory I can treasure for a lifetime. Or gifting her hand-me-downs from Bobby, which Luann very much appreciates. I saved oh. every single thing that Bobby ever wore, sat in, or spit up on. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Aunt Peggy. Meanwhile, her sister-in-law, Myrna, cute name actually, comes to visit for the baby shower, AKA the only time Luann actually looks pregnant. Why is that? No wonder she's the last one here. Most tractors won't go over 10 miles an hour. <laughs> hey, baby sis. Myrna is like Nina from In the Heights, the Kleinschmidt who made it out, but went too far in the other direction by trying to not be the way she was raised. And I bet these little ones would like some juice. They aren't allowed to drink juice. They'll have water and read a book. Not even a cup? Oh, come on. My therapist allows me to have a cup of soda. Two of them good. Myrna starts to worm her way into Luann's life by saying that everything Luann is being taught by Peggy is wrong. Which, to be fair, is super true, but for a later season episode, it's nice that they tried to make both of them wrong in their own ways. Aunt Peggy told me that one too. Put it on its stomach and surround it with lots of pillows and blankets so it feels secure. We now know that's quite dangerous. No one should listen to this woman. Ooh, now that I have four nibblings under the age of five, this episode scares me more than it did when I was 13. However, the reason it's on the list is what comes later. Rather than listening to multiple sources or putting her foot down, Luann merely trades one insecure narcissist for another. Aw, tapping into her childhood trauma. Um, I think we're gonna start listening to Myrna now, Aunt Peggy. It's not that we don't love you, it's just that, well, we want our baby to live. Myrna insists that Luann must have a water birth with the entire neighborhood present. And no painkillers. Drugs are for sick people, Peggy. Luann isn't going to treat her baby like a disease, like you did with your son. Oh no, I couldn't do it. I'm sorry. I'm a fuck when it comes to pain. Even though I know there were issues with it, I kind of feel a little jelly about those moms who had Twilight Sleep chloroform. Luann is uncomfortable with all of this and decides to sneak out while she's in labor. Can I talk to you? Get me out of here now. Consider it done. 
Wow, this is big of you, Peggy. Just saying, despite all of Peggy's problems this episode, she at least listened to Luann, tried to take in her input, or explain to her why she fought that way. Like, oh, when I had Bobby, it was a different time for us. We couldn't rely on gadgets. We had to go off of horse sense. Plus, she was always happy to help. Myrna just brushes Luann off, with the best of intentions, of course, as, oh, you're a trailer trash hillbilly who needs my wisdom. Like when she gives Luann a pillow, as she assumes Luann is going to breastfeed her baby. But thank you for the horseshoe-shaped pillow. It's for feeding the baby. You do realize that you're going to have to feed the baby, right? Oh, come on, formula, or breastfeeding, or both? Who cares? At least the baby's getting fed. Of course, Luann later rejects both her sister-in-law and her aunt when she realizes, Oh, who would have thought? I can make my own decisions. But Peggy takes it really well. I love you so much, Aunt Peggy, but Lucky and I need to do this on our own. I will be right in the waiting room if you need me. I know you will. Is it any wonder Gracie's middle name is Margaret after Peggy? Unless maybe Peggy just took advantage of her being loopy to suggest it? Either or is fine. Plus, later on, it is nice to see Peggy treat Gracie like her granddaughter. Maybe we'll see more of them in the revival. Now, go. Go into the light. The light is good. Mr. Reaper, I'd prefer it if you put your hood back on. Why won't you die? One of the longest recurring plot lines in King of the Hill is the hatred between Cotton and Peggy. Cotton hates Peggy so much that he only calls her Hank's wife. Not once in the series does he call her Peggy. While I already made a video about Cotton with the shadiest of the shadies, Shady Do-Rags, I still think that the show had Cotton decline in a super terrible way in the later seasons and destroyed any character development he had. Because while Cotton was a horrible person, he was an awesome character. Eh, maybe it was leading up to this moment. Cotton gets into a freak accident at a hibachi restaurant due to his xenophobia of Japanese people. Get me weapons! Dad, relax. It's just salt and pepper. Now sit down. Those are Tojo Wampin Sticks, boy! Drop them! Now! Even if he gave up his hatred of the Japanese, as he realized he was tying his hatred of them to not being able to get closure with Michiko, so this should be no issue for him. And he only has days left to live, if at that. And even if, as Hank puts it, he's been through worse and his injuries really don't seem that severe when you start thinking about it. He has severe burns, a broken hip, and torn ligaments, plus he's extremely allergic to shellfish, which caused swelling and an infection in the esophagus. Seriously, it couldn't have been something untreatable, like a heart attack, or his shins got infected, or maybe there is a cure for his condition, but he's so stubborn that he holds off until it's too late, or something worse happens. Regardless, the one redeeming moment about this episode, which even Peggy's critics will say is awesome sauce, is how she tells off Cotton. The whole episode, Hank tries to think of the perfect way to tell his father goodbye, but Cotton continues to be like himself. I love you too, Dad. What kind of man tells another man he loves him? I don't want to die with my sissy son who loves me. You gonna bring me roses cause you love me? Hank, how dare you say you love your own father? Slap slap. I should rescind your assistant manager role. When Hank leaves the room, Peggy tries to do whatever to get Cotton to croak. But she can't take it anymore, and the episode is almost over. Instead, she lays on thick how much she hates him, how much everybody hates him, and how truly pathetic he is. In fact, I hope you do go on living forever. As the unhappy person you are, I hope you live forever. I really do. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> mm -mm, the serious moment. Do you now? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, he's gone. Are you sure? Regardless, you go, girl. You angel of death, you. 
My only gripe with this episode is what she did with Bobby. In order to establish a B-plot, as this episode is kind of dark and it would need one. Do you think Bobby knows? No, and I don't think he should be around for this. Even if I think Bobby is, like, old enough to handle this or at least be told what's going on, he was closest to Cotton out of everybody, including Cotton's own son. And he saw Cotton collapse at the restaurant. What, are they just gonna say Cotton fell asleep? <sighs> I do think she had the best of intentions, but you gotta be fair, and it's worth mentioning. Hey, Luann, guess what we're having for dinner tonight? Flapjacks! <laughs> <gasps> Kitty, if you tell another riveting life story, I'm gonna be mad. But, but it's about how I did the morning announcements in high school, and the principal called me Gabby, not Abby, for like a month straight. Nobody cares about that chubby chick that dresses like a giant butterfly. Now do your job. Fine, I guess I could do my job. Okay, and they'll not be proud, Bobby gets approved to be the new morning announcements guy. Well, it's temporary, but he's still approved. His shtick is making puns and being funny. Which doesn't work because either Emily psychs him out. Mike Soto didn't have to be funny. He had credibility. You better be funny. I Sorry, I was never her biggest fan, even if she fought up zombie plant people, or his material is too corny for people to enjoy. This was the later seasons, after all, and the Raiders forgot about the propaniacs. Nurse Barrow turns 40 today. Of course, that's still two years younger than the meatloaf in the cafeteria. Piggy, who is waiting around for a substitute teaching gig, decides to help Bobby by introducing a laugh track of sorts. Whenever he tells a joke, she will ring a cowbell. In sports news, I still can't play him. <laughs> no good at sports. Oh. They're an instant success, and even if this would have been enough for the episode to make the list, I just think I should go a step further. During their last broadcast, Peggy is offered a substitute teaching gig by the principal, and a lucrative one at that. How'd you like to sub Spanish? Now, it's gonna require a two-week commitment. Oh my god, I could give a test and grade it? Piggy, unless you're long-term, no sub is supposed to give actual work. That's how your students learn to hate you. Why can't you just be like every other teacher and play Matilda on the TV? Still, rather than just tell Bobby, you can use the cowbell yourself, I have faith in you, or asking for five extra minutes, she rejects the offer and joins him in one final broadcast. I am sorry, but I have a previous commitment. Good morning, Tom Laundry Middle School. I hope you're all clean. Tom Laundry. Flapjacks, the radio demon would be proud of you guys. You said I was a genius. Didn't you read the fine print on your diploma? It clearly states no refunds. Nada. Refundo. When I started making this list, I thought about whether or not I should include this episode or Death in Texas. And as you can guess, the substitute Spanish prisoner won out. Peggy oh, starts to lose confidence in herself. I have always had all the answers, and today I didn't, and I'm scared. What if I'm really not as smart as I think I am? <laughs> That's like if Spongebob stopped laughing. Until she takes an online genius test, which strangely labels her a genius. Even if she's of average intelligence, I guess you could say. Really, it's her ego that blinds her. Copies of the handsome official registry of members featuring your name, Peggy Hill, may be purchased for only $39.99, a $59.99 value. But as we all know, every single genius test offered online is 100% accurate. She simply has to pay them tons of money to make sure she gets a PhD. I don't have to tell a genius what a doctor earns. Peggy, are you worth investing in? Totally the truth. Peggy would be the best Scientologist. Only... Who could have guessed? It's a major scam. I do not need you to clean up my messes. It's over, Peggy. Let me put this in words even a genius can understand. 
You are not a genius. Robert Fayoza. You know what? I can't say his name for some reason. I'm just gonna call him Yoza, like the food. Obviously refuses to give her back her money or any of the dozens of other people he scammed. Dr. Robert Vizosa is a con artist. The PhDs he sold us aren't even worth the paper we printed them on. No. <gasps> Not wanting to be a fool, Piggy attempts to con the con man by holding a fake gambling parlor. My source has already taken us for $8,000. If I lose this, I'll have to be buried at sea. You have my word, they will put you in the ground. Of course, Yoza sees through all of this and takes their money and then some. He didn't place the bet. What, what are we gonna do, Peggy? He, he took all our money. Hank even has to spell it out to Peggy how stupid she is. <laughs> I should have listened to you, but I didn't. While you were talking, I was humming a song inside my head just waiting for you to stop. Only, as it turns out, this was all an act. Peggy had Boomhauer install a safe in Yoza's hotel room, and then she stole it back when he was distracted, meaning she got their money back. Thanks, Boomhauer. I knew I could count on you not to talk. Yo, man. No. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Though compared to Def and Texas, she not only helped herself, she also helped a bunch of other people. True, they were gullible, but think about how many scam artists get to walk away free. Or even if they are caught, you're never seeing that money again. On top of that, Peggy also had a bunch of other backup plans in case this one did not pan out. The gambling room, the safe, heck, apparently they were gonna do something with his car. Bizosa valet parked his car. The Econo Suites doesn't have valet park. You were gonna steal his car. That would have been a felony. Get off your high horse, Hank. He's a criminal. It's all right. Honey, tell me, what is it like to live without shame of any kind? Is it a good feeling? Yeah, it is. Would you believe me if I told you King of the Hill was originally meant to be a spin-off of Beavis and Butthead? You know, a show about wild, obnoxious teens who care about nothing but food, bad television, and boobies? Yeah. In Square Peg, the school believes it's time to teach the kids about reproduction. The birds, the bees, and the eggs. The egg lovers take experimental drugs to not like eggs or be pedestrians. Something like that should uh, be taught in the home. Uh-huh, where he lives. Absolutely. Yes, sir. -y. As conservatives in the 1990s, Hank and Peggy don't want Bobby learning about ugly bumping from school. He has to learn it from home. I mean, at school, they might brainwash him into wanting to dress however he wants or oh, accept people from all walks of life. Oh my goodness. They try to tell Bobby themselves, as Hank is too squeamish and watching a cow get inseminated doesn't cut it. Oh, Hank, you dirty little doggy. Peggy is up, and she can't do it. Have something that girls do not have. You mean a- <laughs> Oh well, at least they know it's still being offered at school. He can learn it there. Yeah, too bad there's another wrinkle. When Dale got word of the health class teaching about PG-13, he kept calling the health teacher until she felt threatened enough to quit. They found the substitute teacher of the year. Uh, 1995? 1996. Meaning that as a substitute teacher, Peggy now has to teach about that. She does whatever she can to get past her squeamishness, like practicing in front of a mirror. Ovaries. Uvula. Uterus. Feed the fish. <laughs> Eventually, the big day finally comes, only to learn... Those of you whose parents did not give you permission to learn with me, well, you can read for an hour in the school library. Sorry, Peggy. Mrs. Peggy. Sorry, Peggy. Sorry, Peggy. Sorry, Peggy. Sorry, Peggy. Sorry, Peggy.
know what that is. Honestly, I like to think most of those kids already know what that is and they just don't want to learn. So they did not go for the effort of having the permission slip signed. Come on, would you rather do work or would you sit in the library for an hour and just goof off? But one child remains. Looks like it's just you and me, Mom. Okay, son. Well, let's begin with the difference between boys and girls. The reason it's on the list is not only due to Peggy's dedication to the art of teaching, but how she breaks the cycle by actually having a conversation with her son. As we learn from flashbacks, her only exposure to the talk was her mother giving her a book called The Loveliness of Woman. The Loveliness of Woman. There's nothing in here but pictures of flowers. It says, without actually saying it, that to a woman, that is a chore, not a pleasure, that your husband can demand from you at any time, and that you cannot refuse, albeit it is necessary to make bebes. But if you have to do it, just think of the flowers. Well, I got a lot out of it. When my husband would crawl all over me at night and do his business, well, I would just close my eyes and think of them pretty flowers. Well, that's dark. How dare you have control over your own body, your sense of pleasure? Eh, at least she got a talk. I was always told, you'll find out when you're older. Dude, I'm 12. I think that's old enough. Did you guys get a talk? How did you find out? I really enjoy how Peggy tried to give Bobby a talk with no shame. Just told him what it was in a clean cut, honest manner, and likely answered any questions he might have had. In a way, we need more teachers like her. Could you flunk the flying Hawaiian? Haven't you ever heard of no pass, no play? Hear me out. In high school, our main sports were lacrosse, soccer, and basketball. Nobody liked playing football. I think one of the kids I graduated with played basketball for Stony Brook. Point is, even if we had a lot of awesome players, the school made it a point that academics came first. They would put aside time for the teams to do homework before practice, and if you had a failing grade, no exceptions, you did whatever to make it up. Apparently, Texas doesn't do that. This is crunch time. We're going up against San Marcos, Belton, and McMainerberry. McMainerberry, we need him to go to state. Guys, it's just a sport. Hank and the boys are on the booster club for Arlen football. Even if none of the people present, besides possibly Buck, likely have any high school age children. Meanwhile, Peggy finally achieves her dream of getting to substitute for high school. Guess who was subbing for high school geometry teacher, Tammy Charbonneau of me, Peggy Hill. That was going to be my guess exactly. Around this time, she meets a boy named, whew, bear with me, David Kalaiki Ali. David Kalaiki Ali. Wait, oh my God, I'm lost. Hank, how do I say it? And you must be David Kalaiki Ali. Uh, yep. I guess you might have heard of me. Well, yes, you are the person who did not answer present when I took role 28 minutes ago. Anyhow, David, who you must refer to by his full name, not David K or David K.A., is known as the Flying Hawaiian and a stellar football player. Even if, I don't think the Flying Hawaiian is a good name. He should be called the Whale or the Mummy. Eh, I guess those aren't catchy. David is a great athlete, but he's a lazy student. But for the sake of football, the teachers let him coast by, rather than provide any actual help. As she's a teacher, and she has her morals, but no code of honor, Peggy wants to do right by David. Not for the sake of her ego, but again, because it's the right thing to do. This kid deserves an education, and if he fails at football, what is he gonna do with his life? Come on, look at Hank and Bill. I have noticed that you have a zero grade. You have no homework points and no participation points. Uh-huh. When Peggy notices how bad his math grade is, she offers to tutor him. And when he refuses, she stays up all night making him a study guide. One that will appeal to him. Too bad David has to refuse to do that too. David, 
I just want to say that it has been a pleasure educating you. I think I have learned just as much from you as you have from me. Come on, dude. This, th she gave you, like, tons of chances she did not give anybody else. And that arguably she did not have to. Later, when David obviously fails, she gives him an F on his midterm, leading to academic suspension from football. I mean, come on, it's only fair. Now he's out for three weeks academic suspension. Do you know what happens in those three weeks? San Marcos, Belton, McManaberry, McManaberry, Hank! And she stubbornly holds on to her decision, even if everybody hates her for it. Be it her fellow teachers, the booster club, likely some of the students, or even Hank for a few minutes. But teaching high school is my going to state. Uh, no offense, Peggy, but I don't see anybody renting buses to go to your state. The only reason David ends up passing is the booster club goes over her head by giving him a work-study program to do instead. What if we got him a work-study like I had at the print shop my junior year? Yeah! David drops Mrs. Hill's class, takes a work-study at Terrell's print shop. Wait, do booster clubs in real life have this much power? I thought they just had bake sales and raised money. Eventually, Peggy wises up and tries to tell David's mother, who was also Hank's insurance adjuster. His mom lies and says that David is learning disabled. And tries hard, he just can't really remember anything. Sports is all God gave David, and it's the only way he'll get to college. Obviously, special ed is not an option, or an IED. By doing so, Peggy becomes so sympathetic that she doesn't tell on David to the principal or the administration. And the Oscar goes to me! <laughs> Come on out, fellas! <laughs> David finds out what his mother and the booster club did and personally goes to Peggy, finally realizing what she was trying to do for him and requesting that she should teach him, even if it's only a quick lesson. I am so proud of you, David, but I could not even teach Albert Einstein all of geometry in an afternoon. Therefore, she chooses propane. If you want to remember the chemical formula for propane, C3H8, Maybe you could remember it like an audible. Say, three, H, eight. Yes, this helps me so much. <gasps> We're gonna be a family again. I will tongue kiss Bill before I let that tramp in my house. Even if Luann is not Peggy's child, as in she gave birth to her, she still treats her like flesh and blood, despite Hank's protests. For no other reason than Luann needs good influence, not for Peggy's own ego or moral desert. While well, I have problems with Hoyt or how Peggy is arguably the reason Luann declines in the later seasons, not lucky. This moment is one of Peggy's best, if not the best. Well, this and when she told off Hank for effectively forcing Luann to go back to the trailer, i.e. the place where all of her trauma happened, just so he could get his den back. And Lulu said the trailer's wrecked, so I guess I'm currently unresidented. But this episode, it's better. For those of you who don't know, the reason Luann is staying with the Hills is because her mother, Leanne, stabbed Luann's father with a fork and knocked over their trailer. While Luann's father ran away from home to work on an oil rig, as he was too scared of his own wife to be a father. Actually, Kitty, I think they might have retconned that. No, that's an imposter. The real Hoyt is off on his oil rig. He's like Barney's father. Just let me have this head cannon. In Leanne's saga, Leanne gets paroled and comes to visit with the Hills. At first, she's just visiting. Until she lets it slip that... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, do you have a job? No. Wait, she can't stay at a halfway house? I thought she had a problem with drinking. Rather than have Luann become parentified, like Steven, Peggy allows Leanne to stay with them. The problem is, she's simply too selfish to be a mother. Yeah. Uh, we still have today. Oh, me and Billy D are going out to celebrate today. I want you to see my puppet show. And when she gives in to her vices, 
especially alcohol, she's even worse. Peggy tries to be there for Luann. Despite this, who is in denial about what her mother is really like? For example, before the visit, she tries to gently explain to Luann that her life is a Degrassi episode. I am just so proud of everything you've accomplished since we took you in. I just do not want you to get distracted and, and lose your way, honey. Especially after Hoyt refuses to come home or forgive Leanne. We're never going to be a family again, Aunt Peggy. He won't forgive Mama. Honey, marriage is about trust. And she, well, she betrayed him. Or she offers to attend Luann's functions when her mother won't. I would love to see your show, Luann. Great! You could save a seat for Mama in case she changes her mind. Eventually, Leanne starts to drink like crazy after she gets engaged to Bill. Supposed to be a surprise! Ooh. I won't! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh my god, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to spoil things. Peggy tries tough love to get Luann to see things her way. Well, I am sorry, but I have not got time for the pain. The next time that woman breaks your heart, I am not going to be waiting there to say, I told you so. Or at least put some distance between herself and her mother. What should we do? Well, I am going to go close up the mustard before it crusts, if you'll excuse me. But she gives in when she sees Leanne about to repeat history, this time with Buckley. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am, but that was my fork. But that's not all. She gives this lady a cold, hard truth. Being a mother is hard, but it's her job. And if she wants a fresh start, she can't rely on the bottle. I hope someday you can live without alcohol. But until that day, we can all live very nicely without you. I'm sorry. <sighs> I've been acting pretty foolish, everyone. Aww. It works for all the five seconds. <laughs> Thankfully, as we all know, Peggy has feet longer than a lamprey. I've always wanted to try that pie. Where can I get one? Well, there's one thing that you didn't count on. My brother has got size six feet, but I don't. Oh, yeah! This finally allows Luann to see reality, reject her mother, and accept Peggy as her new mommy figure. Even inviting Peggy to mother-daughter night at school, something she previously refused to allow Peggy to do. I am a substitute teacher. I would be happy to substitute for your mom. Thanks, Aunt Peggy. I don't think Mama would want anyone to take her place. The reason this is running so high is simple. Selflessness. Perhaps the one good thing you can say about Peggy is, barring the occasional episode or moment, she's usually a good mother and a great aunt. She accepts Bobby for who he is, whereas Hank is totally fine forcing him to be a towel manager or painting over his walls. And in a way, she saved Luann from becoming trailer trash, which was cemented here. Not that there's anything negative about living in a trailer. It's immensely cheaper, and I mean, John Redcorn lives in a trailer, but ugh, you know what? Forget it. Stop! Okay, please hand in your midterm. 